mass extinction event, or as it's more informally called, the Great Dying. 251.9 million years ago, roughly 98% of life was completely wiped out. Life on planet Earth was just 2% away from starting all over again, as it had done billions of years ago. Now how the hell is life going to come back from that? Now, if you know anything about life in our universe, you know that the odds of life developing on this rock are astronomically low. So the fact that we bounce back from just 2% means that we're twice as lucky to be here. So 251.9 million years ago, the Permian and in turn the Paleozoic era came to a devastating close, opening up to the very first period in the Mesozoic era, the Triassic. Yes, for the first time in this history of our series, we're talking about dinosaurs. Finally! But just before we do, I really recommend that you watch my Permian video, otherwise you're gonna find how things kicked off here really quite confusing. So the Triassic began, and things on Earth looked worse than a Chrysler PT Cruiser. The oceans were full of diverse... Uh, corpses, and in turn, anoxic waters. On land, things look much the same, with barely a plant in sight and if you were lucky enough to see a vertebrate animal, it likely would have been a Lystrosaurus, the most abundant tetrapod on Earth at this time. In fact, at one point, Lystrosaurus actually made up around 95% of all land vertebrates. Now we'll get into why soon enough, but first why don't we take a look at what this big old rock was up to. Pangaea was very much still a thing, drifting slightly towards the North Pole as the period progressed. Now, spoiler alert, the Earth ends up looking like this, and this modern rendition doesn't actually look too dissimilar to how it did at the end of the Mesozoic. It may appear to be very different to Pangaea during the Triassic, but all the pieces were aligned to take their modern places, with Gondwana being made up of South America, Africa, Antarctica and Australia, and LaRussia being made up of North America and Eurasia. Now, remember that semi-inland sea, the Paleotethys Ocean? Well, this would now be joined by its successor, the Neotethys Ocean, coming in from the south. You see a small continent cropped up known as Chimeria, which would later incorporate itself into parts of Mid and South Asia, and separated these two oceans. As it went on its journey northwards throughout the Triassic, it would force the Paleotethys to shrink and the Neotethys to grow. Now Chimeria's collision would continue all throughout the Mesozoic, so make sure you remember that for future videos. Maybe subscribe so you don't miss them. Now this sea wasn't the only change that was happening during the Triassic. Pangaea didn't break up during this period, but it was showing signs of it, with extensive faulting and rift systems rearing their heads at many of the points where the land masses would eventually break up. Then we have what concerns every Englishman, the weather. Technically for this video, the climate. Much like in the Permian, this supercontinent led to a globally homogenised climate that was seasonal and very dry in the middle. Without the ocean, which acts as somewhat of a weather stabiliser and was pretty low at this point, we see a lot of extremes. One thing was different from before though, and that is the carbon dioxide levels that were present, as well as the effects it has on the planet. Since the cataclysmic event that was the Permian mass extinction event, Carbon dioxide levels were actually a little higher than today for most of this period, kicking off what would be a very warm chapter in Earth's history known as the Mesozoic Greenhouse. But now let's take a look at the life that was actually inhabiting these conditions, starting with the sea. Marine life was hit worse during the PT mass extinction event, so the sea started off looking pretty barren. But the more that gets wiped off the face of the planet, the more blank space there is for new groups to fill. Many modern groups of corals first appeared around this time and quickly began to build reefs around the globe, with bivalves rapidly diversifying and ammonites making a comeback from just a single line. Fish remain pretty uniform with ray-finned fish dominating the sea and freshwater environments, along with many freshwater lungfish and cartilaginous fish retaking their spots as top dogs for the most part. New groups even popped up such as the worm serpulids or the predatory fish known as cerecthiids. In short, 
Despite what a rough time they had during the last extinction event, Life in the Sea was actually making a really remarkable return to form. Amphibians, whilst not hitting the peak that they did during the Carboniferous, were doing pretty well for themselves too. Temnospondyls survived but didn't last too long, whereas Stereospondyls were hugely successful by the Mid-Triassic, with giants such as the Mastodonsaurus occupying crocodile-like niches. We even see the very first Lys amphibians, which are the only group of amphibians still alive today. Now, as we get more securely onto land, things can only be described as a new normal. Now, I do have a video on the Triassic weirdos, but I'll kind of explain what happened as a whole now. Like I stated before, the most abundant vertebrate at this time was the Lystrosaurus, a herbivorous synapsid that likely managed to survive since it was able to feed on the tougher roots which served as the most abundant flora at this point. Now this is an example of a pioneer organism or disaster taxon. This is essentially where the organism in question becomes the only survivor in one fell swoop and ends up occupying the entire region. In fact, this is actually the only time in Earth's history that a single genus dominated the land to such a degree. It took a very long time for other groups to catch up too. With normal levels of diversification and typical trophic structures only just returning 30 million years into the Triassic. Now, Lystrosaurus reaching this kind of success was mostly down to the fact that it had no competition and also no predators. But not to get all manosphere on you, this did make them lazy. They simply didn't need to evolve any competitive or defensive adaptations, so were easy pickings when challengers did finally come along, meaning these therapsids didn't last past the early Triassic. Now, unlike with the synapsid dominated Permian, everything that had survived was now on an even playing field, because everything was just as screwed before. Land invertebrates hit the point that they're more or less at now, with mostly modern groups surviving, but it was the reptiles that said, hold my beer. Now, sauropsids had clearly just gotten bored of being the underdogs and just went for it. Many of these reptiles return to the sea as we see the first occurrences of famous groups such as the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs in the early Triassic, along with the earliest turtles. One group, however, absolutely exploded on land, known as archosauromorphs. Archosauromorphs ended up occupying almost every single terrestrial niche that you can think of, from long-necked tanistrophids, to gliding chiraviptergids, to stocky herbivores like the rhynchosaurs and the alicotosaurs. One group distinguished themselves from the rest though, utilising their serrated teeth and more upright posture for a more active predatory lifestyle. Phytosaurs and urethrosuchids, with some familiar looking skulls, did dominate the early Triassic, but come the mid-Triassic, true archosaurs evolved, splitting themselves into two main groups, the Pseudosuchians and the Avometatarsalia. Pseudosuchids were a lot more dominant through the Triassic, with herbivorous and heavily armoured aetosaurs and many terrifying forms of Rawasuchians. Now, these guys probably look so familiar because they are in fact the ancestors of crocodiles. These guys ended up being everywhere, from semi-aquatic genera similar to today, to fully terrestrial and upright genera sprinting at you to bite your face off. The Avometatarsalia though was not far behind. Now, differentiated only by a slight change in their ankle structure, these guys had very humble beginnings. Now, their thoughts have first occurred around 249 million years ago and looked superficially fairly generic and small, especially when compared to what else was on land. But eventually they decided, you know what, walking on all fours is overrated. They then started to put a little bit more emphasis on walking on their hind limbs and using their forelimbs for things like grappling food or flying.
Yes, this group known as the Avimetatarsalia gave rise to the first flying vertebrates, the pterosaurs and the dominators of the Mesozoic Earth, the dinosaurs. Now this arguably is one of the most important points in Earth's history, since it birthed the group that launched this science into pop culture, inspiring millions and millions of scientists to push this science forward, as well as YouTube channels that reach and inspire millions and millions of people, just like this one. Oh. The first dinosaurs were theropods that included Coelophysis, as well as prosauropods such as Plateosaurus. Now dinosaurs are classified into two groups based on the placement of their pubis. Cerischia, which includes theropods and sauropods, making them the oldest of the two, and Ornithischia, which encompasses all other dinosaurs. Now this was challenged by the Ornithoskeleta model back in 2017, but that's a discussion for another video. These avometatarsalids were able to rival and eventually outcompete their crocodilian cousins by being larger herbivores, quick predators, and taking to the skies, and overall becoming more effective specialists. Quick side note though, pterosaurs are their closest relatives, but are not dinosaurs. Now thanks to Pangaea holding out just long enough for the arrival of the avometatarsalia, this group was actually able to radiate and settle down globally so that eventually they could evolve and specialise in various different areas as the continent broke up. Now this Triassic takeover might have also contributed to another group's development as well. Now whereas Therapsids were the top dogs before, they had now been displaced by all the other reptiles at this time, meaning they had to change tactics. The only other niches left for a vertebrate was as a small burrowing insectivore. So that's what they became. It was really only the cynodonts left, and to remain even more out of sight, they became mostly nocturnal, likely giving them reason to develop high metabolic rates and fur to keep warm whilst out and about at night. In other words, the late Triassic is when we see the very first true mammals. So in the space of just 50 million years, life showcased its resilience more than ever and bounced back to new heights. Until another extinction. Oh, for fuck's sake! And the end Triassic extinction is actually number four out of the big five extinction events throughout all of Earth's history. Now there's a lot of discussion surrounding what actually caused this event, going from global cooling to once again volcanism, this time caused by camp. As in the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. It's also disputed as to whether this was actually a single event or a series of smaller pulses similar to the Devonian. One thing's for sure though, and that is what made it and what didn't. And this event mostly affected the marine life, with mollusks, brachiopods and corals being severely affected and groups disappearing completely, such as the conodonts and all marine reptiles that weren't ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs or turtles. Things weren't as bad on land, but still weren't great. Terrestrial plants and invertebrates were largely unaffected, but the vertebrates were severely weeded out. This marked the end for all of the large amphibians that weren't in the modern groups mentioned earlier, as well as the remaining non-mammalian synapsids. Many of the strange reptiles of this time also went extinct, with the only remaining archosaurs being the Pseudosuchians and the Avometatarsalians. Now some groups of small reptiles did remain, such as the ones that are ancestral to squamates, but overall the time for experimentation was over. Now it was likely this event that was the final stepping stone needed for the dinosaurs takeover. They had been struggling with the other reptiles for years for domination, but with most of them now out of the way, that was it. Earth was theirs for the taking, and take it they did. But that is something I'll expand upon next time.